Good morning. My name's Sheldon Livesey. I'm the director for of One Accord Ministry, and we are in for a treat today just doing another roundtable kind of a family sit-down time where I'm just doing more sharing than I am uh, doing a message today. Uh, I've had some sickness in our family. We've had three people in the hospital this week, and I've done a couple of nights without any sleep. So if this doesn't come across quite as well as some of the others, or there's a little chopping where I've had to do some cutouts uh, in the video, uh, please forgive me for that. Well, I want to tell you folks, I don't believe revival is any longer nearly here. I believe that as we begin to talk today that we are seeing the uh, sprinkle before the downpour. I've said for a long time that we've been on the precipice of seeing revival happen, but no longer. I believe that the sprinkles are already here. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing things that we've maybe never seen or not seen in many, many years in our local churches begin to take place that gives us hope that something is going on and God is doing it. The answers to many prayers are coming about. So anyway, I need to begin by talking about a little history. And, uh, you know, I believe maybe COVID has been a setup. And I know that God doesn't, doesn't cause things like that, but God does allow things. He allows things to get our attention. He allows things uh, because he, he has warned and he's warned and he's warned America to turn back to him. And we've just sort of slipped through this whole play. It's almost like going to a movie and you just sleep through it and you don't know what's going on. We've been caught up in the American dream. It's like going to bed at night and the alarm goes off and you don't wake up. Well, God has had some alarms go off and we as a nation have not woken up. The church has not woken up. It's not the sinners. It's not the world out there, the lost and dying world, that's supposed to repent and come back to God. It's Second Chronicles 7.14 is written especially to those that believe in God, and that is the church today. And we're going to talk a little about that. So are we getting the picture? If, in other words, God is going to wake us up one way or another. If what is going on in our nation doesn't get our attention, God still has more up his sleeves, so to speak, that he can do to turn up the heat, uh, strengthen the pressure, make it harder so that we will wake up because God's plan right now, I believe, is for a worldwide revival and I'm getting that from national and world prayer leaders, not just preachers, but those that spend enormous amounts of time with God. And they can tell you pretty much what God is saying to the world today. The church can take its place, though. I believe that God is waking up the church because he knows that we're going to take our place and he knows that we're going to be on the front lines of the battle so that we can see this thing turn around because the other option is if we don't, he can continue to let us sleep through it until we get to the place of destruction. But, but really, friends, we don't believe that's going to take place. We believe that we are waking up. And I've harped on one thing since since uh, we started seeing COVID begin, and that was that God showed me that the reason so many people across our nation, I know we've had riots and all of this stuff, but people are anxious, people are afraid, and the reason is that they're not as afraid of getting COVID as God has made people aware that they're not ready if COVID got them. And why is that? It's because, as we mentioned last week, as God's put a big old hole on the inside of us, and it tells us if we're not ready for what is next. And why is that? It's because of God's great love for us. He doesn't want us to go out into eternity if we don't know Him as the Lord and Savior of our life. But the good news, friends, is this. The good news is actually great news because prayer leaders across our nation and around the world believe that God has heard the cries of His people. And more than that, that all of this is fitting into His eternal plan for us. His plan 
wasn't for the church to become anemic and defeated and, and uh, retreating and putting our head in the sands and dividing one denomination against another. And now even churches of the same denomination don't get along and they are afraid to work together uh, for whatever reason. And I can hear the old devil cry across that chasm and he's saying to the kingdom of God, he's saying to God, he says, oh, if you just give me another year or two, I'll have them on all. And you can send your son and there won't be any to come after. Friends, that's not the God I know. Our God is going to come. He's going to send His Son Jesus for a victorious, unspotted, unblemished bride ready for His coming, saying, Come, Lord Jesus, come. God's going to get the last laugh because Isaiah 60 verse 5 says that the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto him. And that's not happened yet. That's why the enemy's fighting so hard is because he thinks he's got it won when in actuality uh, he's saying check to God. You know, checkmate uh, is a term in chess, meaning I've won the game when there's actually the king has one more move and he's fixing to win this game. We believe everything is in place for Jesus coming except that one thing, and that is a worldwide revival or awakening that changes our world, and it brings in the harvest, that end-time harvest that's ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus will be coming for a victorious church, ready for the coming of the bridegroom. Not a cry to escape the world, but because the bride is in love with the bridegroom. That's why we're saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. So what is next if that is the case? What is next <clears throat> is the process of getting ready. Next is the process of deciding if we're going to get on board with God and what God is doing, or if we're going to miss our individual uh, time of visitation with God. You know, God passes us by, and He, he points at us or, or calls for us, and we don't have to answer that call. We can sleep through it, but we miss our time of visitation, and it's a time uh, that will affect our families, our children and our grandchildren, everything around us. So my, so my time together with you today is to encourage you to get on board, to encourage you to hear for God's call, to encourage you to, to uh, sense the spiritual DNA on the inside of you and ask God, as we're going to ask Him in a minute, to activate that spiritual DNA so you'll know the calling that God has in your life and you'll be able to step out into it and to answer that. So friends, I'm going to be talking about a scripture today, and we're going to be finding this uh, in the book of Mark, in uh, the fourth chapter, or the tenth chapter, as we're going to be starting with the 46th verse, and we're going to be talking about Barnabas. And they came to Jericho, and he, Jesus, went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people. Blind Barnabas, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he, Barnabas, heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Can you imagine that? You've got a crowd, and this one man that's a blind a blind man, he, he's not able, he's, he's only hearing noise now. He, he was trying to sense when this group would be coming, that, that Jesus would be with, and it was uh, Jesus, his disciples, and even followers by this time began to follow Jesus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, trying to get Jesus' attention. And when the crowd is roaring and, and waving and all of them want attention, this one man that has the need of sight in his eyes, he has to be louder than the sounds of the world. And they charged him. So he, he, he cried out the louder. And they charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out the more a great deal. Thou Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
Can you not just picture that in your mind? And he got Jesus' attention. Listen, and Jesus stood still. And he commanded this man to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And verse 50, And he casting away his garment, rose, and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, What will that I do for you? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you whole. And immediately he received his sight, and he followed Jesus in the way. Listen, friends, why did Barnabas cause such a scene? Why did he cry so, cry so loud that the others tried to shut him up? What was wrong with this Barnabas that he caused the scene in such a dignified group that day? Think about that. Barnabas was blind, and he knew that he was blind. You see, some of us are blind, and we don't know that we're blind. We are in need, or we're sick in our spirit, and we don't understand that we're sick. We don't recognize it. But blind, Amartus, blind Barnabas knew his condition, and he was crying out because he wanted a touch from the only one that could make a difference. He had heard about Jesus, and he believed if Jesus was who he claimed that he was, then Jesus could heal him. He had figured out that he had one shot on this visitation from God, and he wasn't about to let it pass by. You know what's wrong with America, bro, bro, uh, brothers and sisters? Reruns. <laughs> what do you mean, Brother Sheldon? Reruns? Well, what I mean is if you don't catch it the first time, then we have 500 more times to watch it later and see what happened and see how it ended, right? Barnabas knew that that's not real life. Barnabas knew that he had one shot at getting his eyesight. And that's why he wouldn't let this go. That's why his voice had to be louder than all the other voices. And of all the people there that day, of all the needs that were there that day, we only have record that one of them was met. The man that, lost, that, that, that had to be louder than everybody else. He hears people tell him about what they knew about Jesus, that he, you know, Barnabas knew that Jesus was a teacher, a multiplier of the fishes and the loaves. He was a worker of miracles. He had heard about some of those miracles of healing and Barnabas's ears. Can you just imagine when he was sitting with a little group listening to the stories about Jesus before this day's this day that his ear had perked up about how a lame man had walked. And he said, I have a chance, maybe, a chance of being healed of my, of my blindness, he thought. So he positioned in the way as Jesus was coming. There might have been people around him that maybe helped him get to that place. But now that they're, they're there and Jesus is coming, everybody now wants to be able to see Jesus. So they've just sort of left Barnabas and, and leaving him to his own instincts. And his instincts were that, that all that he had was his voice. He couldn't see, so he had to use his voice to be louder than the sounds of the world the noise of the world, the racket that the world makes. Can you, can you just imagine how you can translate this into the spirit realm today as we need to get the attention of a God that is passing by in this day when revival might be coming our way, getting the attention so that we can fulfill the purpose and the plan that God has put on the inside of us and be a part of this revival, this end time uh, happening of an almighty God. So, so Barnabas is relying on his instinct and, and it got closer as Jesus is getting closer and closer. Barnabas had to have a voice louder than the voices of the world. Jesus, son of David! Jesus, son of David! Have mercy! Have mercy on me! And other people scolding him. Be, be a peace man. Hold your peace. But Barnabas cried out the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me! Let me tell you something. The world generally is not positioned to help you, 
but to hold you back from getting what you need from God. You want me to say that again? The world is generally not positioned to help you. Now, you might have a few friends that help you, but generally the world is positioned to hold you back and to keep you from getting what God has got for you. Keep you from getting what the, the blessings of God and the, and the uh, positioning of God so that you can fulfill that purpose and plan in your life. Barnabas knew that, there, that this was the key for getting what he needed from God. So that's why he cried out the more. This is Jesus coming my way. I have one chance, one chance in a lifetime of getting his attention. And I'm not going to let this time, my time of visitation, pass me by. I don't have another chance. This is the day and age of the world seems to be against our mission and our mission for God. Most Christians don't even know yet what our mission is. You know why we've not asked God? Have you ever thought of asking God, what is it that you want me to do? What is it, well, the reason that you've put me here on this earth? It's not just to grow up and have a family. It's not just to have a career. But in the spirit realm, there's something that you want me to do. What is it, Lord? And get on our knees, get on our faces sometimes, and, and search for the kingdom of God, search for God, search through the Bible until God reveals that to us. Most of the time, we don't go into what we even think we hear because it's so much bigger than we could ever dream or imagine that we don't think it's possible to accomplish it. And, and yet, that's exactly right. We can't accomplish it. But as we surrender our lives into God's life and says, God, I'm taking these first steps that you're going to show me to take, what happens is God begins to lead us in that way. And we look back along the trail and we find that it was all Him and not us even to begin with. That's what he wants with those that he calls into ministry. So let me implore you, would you be willing to stop everything for just a minute and let me pray with you even right now? God showed me that just like on the inside, we have our physical DNA, and I mentioned this just a minute ago, that, that tells uh, it, it's in every cell of your body and it tells your body what your hair color is and your skin color and your height and your weight and everything about it, the color of your eyes, how, how many hairs are on your head. God knows all of that, but, but it's all in our physical makeup. Well, just as we have spiritual DNA, physical DNA, we have spiritual DNA. God also has this on the inside, and inside the spiritual DNA is this purpose and the plan that God wants to reveal to every person on the face of the earth that He's made. I heard, I heard once a pastor say that when we get to heaven, we'll find that there's, there's vast rooms full of all kinds of treasuries and promises and gifts and, and anointings and, and empowerments and people might ask God, what is all of this? And they said, that was what I had for my people down there. And they never asked me. They never stepped into it. They never were interested in having this room of golden treasures to use on the earth. Equippings that would have helped them get through, that would have saved them and their families, their children and grandchildren. God is telling me to be more bold now than ever to encourage people. He didn't make us for leisure. He made us to build His kingdom. Think about that. Think about what would have happened if we didn't have vacations and all of these ways to, to uh, invest our vast amounts of money and if we sent that, spent that instead and invested into the kingdom of God. What would the difference be in our world today if all across America, America had done that? Yes, He's given you skills and careers so that you can, you can claim that, grant, that ground too for the kingdom of God and make sure that you impact the world around us for His kingdom. But listen to me. He didn't make us to go home and to watch 500 reruns of Law and Order or whatever your program is on some TV show. What impact for the kingdom of God does that make? And when you stand before an almighty God, how are we going to account in judgment that we spend our time doing that instead of working to build His kingdom? 
I believe it might not be an issue now. It might be just what everybody does, but I, I'm trying to encourage us to wake up and to take our place, to wake up and to be a part. Father God, I pray for everybody that's listening right now. I pray that you'll activate the spiritual DNA in each and every person. I pray right now that they will yield their ears to you and let you begin to reveal to them this great purpose and plan for their lives. Some have slept through this plan for years. God, wake them up and draw them into the playing field. Show them where to step into that plan for the time left in their lives and to get active for you and the kingdom. Father, we believe that there's people that only we can reach. Show us how to reach them for your kingdom. Show us how to get Jesus to them. And this younger generation, Lord, that has been taught in our schools and colleges to reject you and the faith of their fathers, activate your honing devices on the inside of their spirits that first draw them to you and then activate the spiritual DNA inside of them. Our children and our grandchildren, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Whoo! We're on the way somewhere today, right? Hallelujah. Friends, what's exciting to me right now is we have churches in our community that have not seen a baptism, a salvation in five years, some of them in ten years. The pastors have grown in and preached to the same 30, 40 people that, that they do every Sunday and just nothing has been happening. But, but as of this COVID deal, we're beginning to see those folks begin to have interest in the church like never before. And we're beginning to see salvations in, in some churches every single service now. We're beginning to see baptisms just every week or two now. COVID has got people thinking, these people that have never darkened a church door have been watching you on your Facebook Live or your YouTube Live. Friends, if you don't know how to do Facebook Live, come to the Shepherd Center. I have even bought some churches, the little apparatuses, the whole cameras, so that you can learn to do Facebook Live and get out the message of the gospel of Christ. Now we're ready now these folks that have been watching you are ready to come and start sitting in your pews and they're doing that and we're seeing churches now having people walk these aisles nearly every service and it's not just an isolated church it's not just in one or two i see it all over hawkins county i'm seeing it all over our region i'm hearing reports up in kentucky and down in georgia north carolina all around us that god is doing this they're doing it in churches large and small they're doing it in churches Churches with bapti baptistries and churches where people are having to be baptized in the creek and the ponds and the lakes and, and the rivers, Father. Uh, it, is, it is such a sight. Hallelujah! That's why I believe that the sprinkles of revival are already here. So what's next? At this point, I don't know if we're going to have another round of COVID thing, but I can tell you with what's happening in our nation, I believe that we're having more and more churches and pastors waking up and saying that even if we do, even if we do, we can't afford to ever shut the doors of our churches ever again. We have to reach this lost and dying world around us. We might have to improvise. We might have to do it different, like using uh, the, the means of Facebook Live or YouTube Live, but we're going to get the gospel out and we're going to reach the church, the world. You know the blessings about Facebook Live and YouTube Live. We always think of our family members that are sitting in the pews. And so, so during COVID, we learned by doing Facebook Live and YouTube Live that a little church of 50 would see sometimes 500 people watching those programs. This is, this is a... a these might initially be people right here in Hawkins County, but we're learning that people are watching from all over the United States. How they find us, it maybe it's through a family member that lives in a distant city, but however it is, we're finding people in those distant places, places where the majority of people don't know Christ, but they're watching in because they too are afraid and anxious because of this COVID thing. So you're reaching people around the nation. So let let me encourage you to do a couple of things. Always, 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 did I say always? <laughs> always do an invitation. 
when you normally do an invitation in your church, you might ask people to come forward. And sometimes uh, you would have some counselors that would come up with them or sometimes come to the altar and, and church members would come and help them pray through a prayer to receive Christ. Well, you're, now you've got people watching on YouTube or Facebook Live and they don't know how to pray. They don't know maybe all the dynamics about Jesus. They, uh, they're feeling God tug at their heart. They're wanting to accept Christ, but they don't know how. So what we do when we do it live is we help someone pray through that process. That means that we're going to have to help them. What do you mean, Brother Sheldon? Well, we generally end our invitations with a prayer and people know how to pray, but we're getting people from those other places in the country that don't know how to pray. So what I do is I lead them in confessing that they believe in all the tenets of faith, that Jesus was God sent to earth, born of a virgin, lived 33 sinless years, died on a cross for our sins, that he was buried, that he arose, he was seen of 500 witnesses, and in the presence of his uh, disciples, he ascended back into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and me. And i like to especially add that even a historian back at that time, Josephus, recorded over 500 people testify that they saw and witnessed Jesus alive after he arose from the dead during those 40 days. He took the sins of the world upon himself. He died and to offer us eternal life. But just believing those things does not get us to heaven. So I, I tell people this is what makes the difference is one, we have to ask God to forgive us for our sins, to realize that we're a sinner and admit and confess that that Jesus is Lord. So we're, we're, we're admitting that we're a sinner. We ask God to forgive us of our sins and then, then we surrender our lives. Whatever there is of our life that God can use, we surrender all of it to Him and we place our lives in His hands so that He can be the Lord of our life. So when you post your messages, Facebook Live or YouTube Live, go back into editing the message <clears throat> and have standard information pieces where as somebody prays that prayer with you, they can contact you, contact your church. A way to do that with the address up there, or the phone number, <clears throat> email number, or, or something so that people can contact your church and ask questions of you. And churches, it's time to leave our buildings during the week. God still has some principles in revival that will not be broken. God doesn't do anything without that is bathed in prayer. So if you're going to, if some, you want something going on in your church, if you're one of those that you want to see salvations every single week, what we need to do is actively be engaged in prayer in our church. You need to make sure that you've got a prayer group that's meeting one night a week. And that prayer group is praying for the service upcoming, praying for the pastor, praying for his message, and, and praying that those that are being invited to your church to visit, that God will convict their hearts and prompt them to come to your church. So let me encourage you, if you don't have this prayer group, uh, have a prayer group. Now's a good time to start. And if you don't have a visitation time, now's a good time again to go back to a time of visitation, identifying people that's moving into our, uh, our communities. We understand that it takes as many as five invitations before somebody will actually come and visit your church. So if they don't reject you on a visit, just keep going back and visiting those people over and over again. Uh, have people in your church that you counsel and you show them how to, uh, to do those visitations. And, and, and it's just as simple as inviting people. All you got to do is show up at their doorstep. You can even take them something homemade that they can eat, something that you can share with them as you invite them, uh, some kind of a welcome gift. We went over a long list of these things in a previous message that we did that your church can do. 
not to let this time of visitation pass you by. But one of the keys of revival is this, is we've got to cross denominational lines to see God do this thing. It takes us joining arm in arm, Baptists and Methodists and Pentecostals and others to see the release of what God wants to do. Jesus prayed in John 17, let them be one. Who is them? It's the Baptists, the Methodists, and the Pentecostals. It's not just my denomination, friends. We've got to get that through our, our hearts. It's all of us. Let them be one, even as we are one. Why? Why is it? So the world will know that God sent Jesus. So the world will see the reality of this. So we need to look for ways that we can work together and, and do events together. The devil is going to fight your unity with churches more than he fights anything. Because the one thing that is more dangerous to the devil than prayer is unity. Unity in our churches, crossing our denominational lines, to worship and work together, to evangelize together, and to fight the works of darkness together. Do you know when that happened once, it happened when our founders moved to this nation? See, because literally there were several denominations and they actually wanted to define a state and each denomination have their own state. And that's where the Congregationalists would meet in one state and the Quakers would live in a state and the, uh, the Puritans would live in a state. But they did come together and they formed an alliance. And that alliance was when they wrote the Declaration of Independence and went to war against Great Britain. That's what brought us all together. If they hadn't crossed denominational lines, our nation would still be under the rule of Great Britain. So there was an amazing revival once that took place in Cali, Colombia down in South America back in the 90s or 80s or 90s. 60,000 people began to come together in the soccer coliseum every single Friday and they prayed up, way up into the night every single week. And it caused a national revival, an outpouring of the Spirit of God and it literally changed their nation. <clears throat> We've seen, many of us here have seen the documentary of the revival that happened up in Clay County, Kentucky. And it happened because people had gotten together to pray about the drug epidemic. They crossed denominational lines and they prayed for a couple of years and then they did that prayer walk. But the fr friends, they didn't pray and see God begin to move and then they stopped praying. They still pray. And it was a 10 year period of time. That documentary wasn't about a week. It was about 10 years. We don't give up on God. We don't stop. We don't, we don't pray a while and then quit because we didn't see something happen. But the transformation of that community happened over a 10 year period of time. <clears throat> so you might be asking, what can we do here? Here in Hawkins County. That's what this message is about today. Both as individuals and in churches, we don't want this time of visitation to pass us by. We say, here we are, Lord. Use us. Let us be the ones. Send us, Lord. Let it happen. Let it start here. If revival is going to start anywhere on the earth, let it start here, Lord. But we have to spend time with Him and be sensitive to what He's saying and what He's leading so that we can do what he says to do. We're following him. We're not asking him to follow us. We're not asking him to come in my denomination. We're asking him to come in Hawkins County. And we as the churches cross those denominational lines and say, let us be one, even as you and the Father are one, that your prayer, Lord Jesus, will be answered. Our Monday night prayer group has prayed over the last three years that God would raise up champions here in Hawkins County to lead these efforts. We only have a handful in each church now that's doing all the work. You can go to any pastor and they'll say, I have 5% that's doing all of the work here. It's time to leave the stands, folks, and get out onto the playing field. It's time to put our hands to the plow and to go to work. I believe we need to have different churches literally take a night to come to a public place and pray. We need to have a place set aside. 
Uh, and we do have a, a room set aside in the Vision Center where that could happen in Rogersville, but wherever someone would decide and have a different church responsible for every single night. I believe that we need someone to lead Christians against drugs again for this drug epidemic. I, need that we, I believe that we need to start doing prayer walking again and prayer rallies again. I, need, I believe we need to begin holding monthly evangelistic events at different venues with different churches uh, having their local singers and their local pastors. It's not going to cost a lot except to have the sound system set up. Rick Gage, the national evangelist that was here in June, is offering to come in 2022 or 23 and do a crusade here. But there's many other evangelists that we could choose from. It just takes us coming together under a single banner. There's ministries needed in our county that we don't even have here yet. I'm praying for others who have, uh, are moving in from other areas of the country that have worked in some of those kind of ministries. That as they come here, God will raise them up under one of the banners, maybe, of, of a ministry like of one accord that they could get started and, and get that ministry started here in Hawkins County. So if you've got a ministry harboring on the inside of you, come and sit down and talk with me. And friends, we are willing to help. So ministry leaders, I would like to see ministries get on the same page and come together once a month so that we can pray together and pray for each other. All of us are facing challenges and attacks of the enemy, and we can stand with each other. Ministries in Hawkins County. Listen to me. Listen to me. There's no eyes in kingdom work. It cannot be all about me. It cannot be all about my church, and it cannot be all about my denomination. But together, we can. Together, we can do this thing. John Butler from East Rogersville has kind of helped lead that way now for a couple of years, and he coined the phrase last year under the events that we had to call it better together. So friends, you might be resistant to working with other outside churches, you know, crossing denominational lines. Well, some of us don't even consciously say that. We just say, well, I'm too busy to get involved over there. I'm too busy to join them. Well, let me tell you how this has worked out. <laughs> I've tried that in a point of court, and it doesn't work any different. I've been resistant to what God was calling me to do. And I hear this little voice says, okay, let me send you around the wilderness for 40 more years and I'll see if I can get you more willing to be on board with me. And so God has allowed me to do some laps around the field and I pretty quickly in those laps start realizing, you know, I'm wasting my time and spinning my tracks. Lord, <laughs> please forgive me for not listening to you. I'm coming over on your side and I'm going to join you in your work. So I take a couple of laps and get tired, and I do that. I think I've said here many times, I was on a 40-day fast once about five years ago, and, and usually at the end of one of those fasts, God speaks something that to me is life-changing into me. And one time he gave me kind of a harsh word. He said to me at the end of 40 days, 40-day 40 fast to hear this, he said, why don't you take the sides out of the box that you've got me in and simply let me be God in your life? He asked me, that's a pretty hard question, isn't it? And I said, well, Lord, I don't have you in a box. <laughs> you know, when you look, you can see the boxes that every other group has God in, right? But you don't see it on yourself. So you have to go to some of these others. That's why it's good to join in. And you ask them, what box do you see that I've got God in so he can't work in our community to the greatest degree. And friends, if you've got some good friends, they'll tell you. <laughs> they'll tell you what those boxes are. And then we go to God and we have to be honest with ourselves and with him. I personally talked to John Kilpatrick that was the pastor of Brownsville Church back in 1995 to about 2000 when they had that amazing revival down there that lasted five years. 
churches next door complained to him. Churches next door were writing articles against that church and they saw a million people come to Christ out of the five million people that went through that church during those five years of revival. People lined up every single night, all night long, waiting for the next night to get into their church because God was moving. And I've seen, I know people personally whose lives were changed and who's affected. I know one man personally that, that uh, have seen 70,000 people come into the kingdom of God simply because of the work through his hands. And it, it started at that Brownsville revival. So don't anybody tell me that wasn't of God. I wished I had gone. But those churches down the street from Brownsville, they could have had tens of thousands of people come through their doors too if they had just gotten on board with God. But they chose to let their time of visitation pass them by. You know, we have 85% of our county that are not in church on a given Sunday morning. Most of them were raised in church, but they've chosen the things of the world over the things of God, and they choose not to be a part of God's kingdom. And they... We, that's our time. They've let their day of visitation pass. None of them even know the purpose and the plan that God has for their lives. They're missing the very potential that heaven has buried on the inside of them. And then those in our churches, the ones that are in our churches, only 5% do all of the work. 95% of us are pew sitters. And many of those are complainers. We won't touch it. But if it doesn't suit us, we'll complain about it. <laughs> Pastors, you know that. We have slept through the play, folks. These folks have missed their time of visitation too. But it's never too late to wake up. It's never too late to repent and get back on track with God. That's why I'm pleading with us today. If they know a smidgen about their purpose and the plan, they would rush to get out of the world situation back onto the playing field and get involved with what God is doing and allowing the Holy Spirit to empower them and doing things that they would be exponential to anything that they can accomplish on their own. I met people who had big visions of what God wanted them to do, but they spent their life sitting on a couch in front of TV, watching TV, and waiting on God. It just don't work that way, Lord, folks. If you want to get out of the playing field, start seeking God and start getting out and doing something. Do something. Do it, do it in your church. Do it with a ministry, but get up on your feet and begin doing. Put your hands to do something. And then through that, God sometimes will, God will reveal to you what it is that He wants you to do. You know those old pumps, you used to have a pump and you'd pump it and no water would come out. You had to get some water and put in the pump and you'd pump it and water would be released. You prime the pump and you do that in ministry as well. Well, as we end today, there might be someone out there that does feel convicted. You know, I, I am one of those that needs to be in church. I am one of those that um, if I died tonight, I'm a, I've been afraid and anxious because if I died tonight, I don't know if I would go to heaven. And I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me today as we close this time. And that prayer is just simply something because God is tugging at your heart and you feel this, this uneasiness because you know you're not ready. If you died today, you're not ready for eternity. And you're saying in your heart, I want to be ready, Brother Sheldon. I don't want to feel like this. I don't want to go through the rest of my life not knowing and then wake up to be at the judgment seat of Christ and be rejected. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, ask, I'm going to pray a prayer with you. I'm going to ask you to pray from the depths of your heart. This has to be your prayer. It can't be mine. And we've already gone through part of it today, so I'm just going to go through that. But the prayer will go something like this. Is Father, I come to you realizing that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I can't reach up to you, but I believe that you can reach down to me, even right now, because Jesus is my intercessor in heaven. I believe Jesus came to this earth. He was God in heaven and came to this earth, was born through a virgin. 
I believe that Jesus lived those 33 sinless years so that as a sinless man, he could die in my place because the wages of my sin is death. I deserve to die for my sins. And Jesus took those sins upon himself. He died on that cross. He was buried in a grave. He stayed in the grave three days. And then you raised him from the dead, Lord God. And, and he was seen of those many, many witnesses. And then he took his disciples on the Mount of Olives. And he ascended back to heaven where he sits at your right hand, even right now, interceding for me as I'm praying this prayer. I believe that, Lord, but Brother Sheldon says that's not what saves me. What saves me is this, Lord. I come to you now admitting I'm a sinner and I'm asking you to forgive me of all of my many sins. Please come and forgive and heal me, Lord. Forgive me of all of my sins. And Lord, I'm asking that I, I, whatever there is in my life that you can still use, I surrender all of it to you right now. All of it, Lord. Jesus, come and live your life through me. Now, Father, I want to thank you for just saving me from eternal separation from you. Thank you for just writing my name in your eternal book. And thank you for giving me a home in heaven. So when I get to heaven, you'll say, enter in, you were mine. Father, I'm, I'm coming to you just saying thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now friends, just real quick, let me tell you four things that you need to do. Number one is you need to begin to communicate with this God that you've just asked, you've just given your life to. Communicate with Him. You talk to Him just all through the day. Not just one time a day for a minute or two or five minutes. You talk to Him every single day, all through the day. He already knows everything about you. But what He wants most from you is your, is your relationship. He wants an intimate relationship with you. you already, he already knows everything about you. He wants you to know some things about Him. So the second thing to learn how to, to know about what God and His nature and what He expects of us is to get a copy of the Bible and begin to read it. And I would begin in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that tell about the stories of Jesus, read through the New Testament that was written after Jesus' time, and then go back and just read your Bible over and over again. Read a little bit every day and you will have read through the whole Bible every year. And the Bible will begin to reveal to you the nature of God, His love for us, and what He expects and needs of us. Thirdly, find a good church home. A church home that can disciple you, that can help grow you, and can bring together a bigger family that can support you during this time of growth. There's a, a small child, a baby, that's born on the inside of you today, and you've got to protect that growth as that baby grows, and a church can help you do that. And then fourth, begin to go tell everybody what just happened in your life. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. So Father, uh, we're praying for all of these that have just made this decision today that you will grow them and strengthen them as they grow in your kingdom and you activate the spiritual DNA on the inside of every single one so they'll know the purpose and the plan of, for your life, their lives and you'll lead them in that and grow them in it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for the privilege of being able to share with you today. I am so excited to be with you. So God bless you, and you have a great day.